Hello everyone and welcome back to STEM with Ari. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait, my favorite YouTuber said that he'd be back like months ago, right? Like one or two months. It's been one or two months and I only got one video. So where is this, where has this man been? You know, like why hasn't he been posting? Well, long story short, for around the next three or four weeks after I posted that video, I got really sick and uh, I had a fever, I had a cough and after that, like, the next two weeks after those four weeks, it was just midterms. And then after that, I joined, like, a new research project. But I finally am back. And this time, I actually mean it. Unless I somehow get sick again, I'm actually back. So today's video is about how to study for CS61A. And I know you all have a midterm in three days. Right now, I'm recording this. It's Tuesday, October 24. And your midterm is on Friday, October 27. So I actually have everything that I'll be covering for you organized nicely in this handout. Uh, it's about four pages and they will cover pretty much the main concepts that you should be aware of while you're taking the test. But before we begin actually going over this handout, I really need to underscore one important thing. If there's one thing that you should be taking away from this video, it should be this. Right now, most people who are taking CS61A or most people who will take CS61A in the future, probably most people who have taken it in the past, think of CS61A as a class that teaches you some languages, you know, Python scheme, which is a dialect of Lisp used for functional programming, and they'll teach you SQL, which is used for database management. And people think, oh, this class will teach me three languages and all the syntax, and that's pretty much all I need to take away from this class. But no, don't think of this class like that. Don't think of CS61A as a class that just teaches you how to program in certain languages and use syntax, because really the key focus of this class is problem solving. It's not about learning the syntax of languages. It's more about applying the syntax of these languages to solve problems. So that's the mindset that you need to be going into this midterm with. And that's the mindset you should also be practicing with when you do your practice tests, when you review the study guide. That's exactly the mindset that you should have. So with all that out of the way, let's start diving right into the study guide. So this is actually a study guide that I wrote as a part of HKN in spring 2023. And it's the common pitfalls, tips, and tricks in Python for a CS61A. This was geared towards the final but really this will help you for midterm two as well. And especially as you're pushing and progressing towards the final. So introduction, this guide targets the common pitfalls of students in CS61A based on numerous anecdotal student experiences. So really, if you go into CS61A and you start talking to these different students, these are the experiences that they all have in common. And this also includes some tips, tricks, and advice on how to approach some of the hardest problems that you might encounter on the final, or in this case, midterm two. And this is going to be targeted towards the current scope of CS61A. So let's get right into the Python, right? We need to review some key concepts to remember in Python that will be the bulk of the course. Python is the main language that you'll be working with, and it will also be the bulk of your midterm and your final exam. So we start off with object-oriented programming. Something that we have to remember every time we do an object-oriented programming question is that we're always going to be dealing with objects, which are instances of classes. So the self keyword is something we have to keep in mind. The self keyword is something students forget all the time, but it needs to be the prefix of all of our instance variables and OOP questions, especially for the skeleton coding questions. So whenever we define a variable, we have to write self whenever we answer these questions. And a lot of students forget to write this and lose points, even though they're otherwise easy points on the test. So don't forget this write self whenever you're doing object oriented programming questions. The next key point is about mutability. So a big point of emphasis when we're talking about Python is the difference between mutable types and immutable types. Mutable types are types that can be mutated, that can essentially be changed fundamentally from within. And immutable types are types that we cannot change at all. We can only copy and move around these types, but we can never change them. This is absolutely essential for particularly involved environment diagram questions where multiple variables and other types with the same name may be declared and modified. So often in past midterms, which again are the absolute number one resource that you should be going back to when you're practicing for your midterm and your final. You'll see in many problems, they often try to trick you by using the same name or similar names or even intentionally confusing names in the problems. But if we understand the concept of mutability, we will be able to answer these questions no matter what. So the first thing we have to understand is immutable types. Immutable types such as integers cannot be mutated. They can only be reassigned. They can only be passed into functions, assigned, etc by copy. This always happens by copy. They can be accessed if declared in outer, which can be a parent or a global frame, but they can never be modified as long as they aren't declared locally as well by the same name. And obviously if they're declared locally, then anytime we refer to that name locally, it will be referring to the one that we declared locally. It won't be referring to the one that was in the parent frame or declared globally. So for instance, statements like x equals two are intuitively assignment, right? We're assigning the value two to 
the variable x, literally, as written. But perhaps less intuitively, x plus equals 1, which tells us increment x by 1, right? Take the previous value of x, add 1 to it, and put it back into x. That's also assignment, because we're taking x plus 1 and we're assigning that new value to x as its new value. Even though plus equals might look like mutation to you, x is not being mutated in this case. x is being reassigned. Next, in contrast to immutable types, we have mutable types, as you can see here. So mutables such as lists, lists are the number one mutable type that you'll see on any test in CSS1A. They're used all the time in midterms and finals. You have to know how to use lists. Lists can be mutated using member functions and reassigned. And they're always passed into functions assigned, etc. by reference. I.e. we're going to be working with the pointer to the object itself, not just a copy of the object by value. And the key here is to remember that they can be both mutated and reassigned. So they can be accessed and modified if they're declared in an outer frame but they can only be modified and reassigned if they're passed into a function as an argument, as long as they aren't declared locally as well by the same name. Otherwise, we're going to be dealing with that local version of that variable and not the one that we declared in the parent frame or the global frame. So statements like a.append2 are intuitively mutation, right? We're taking a, which is a list, and we're appending two to the end of the list. So we're just taking the original list and we're mutating it by putting two into that. But less intuitively, even a statement like a of zero equals two is mutation. Even though we might naively go back to the previous case where we said x equals 2 is assignment and not mutation, and, we're, and we might say, oh, well, a of 0 equals 2 is also assignment because, of course, we're just assigning 2 to a of 0. That's not how it works. a of 0 equals 2 is mutation in Python. And importantly, we must default to using member functions instead of a plus equals the list 2 if a isn't passed into the function. So we have to be using member functions to mutate a unless we're passing a into a function. The next thing that we have to remember is undefined names and environment diagrams. So this is something that the writers of these midterms and finals exploit all the time in every test, basically. So an important distinction to make, particularly relevant to environment diagrams, but also just the flow of Python in general, is undefined names. So when a name is undefined in the local frame, you have to know exactly what Python does. Python doesn't just say, oh, well, this, this variable doesn't exist, we won't look for it. Python will deliberately go into the parent frame of that current frame, it will go into that parent frame and it will look it will look everywhere for that variable. If it doesn't exist there, it will go into the parent frame of the parent frame and it will look for the variable. And it will keep doing that until it finally finds where that variable is defined. And this is relative to where the function is defined, not necessarily where it's called. So when we're considering functions with undefined names, it doesn't matter where the function is called at all. Just scratch that. Don't, don't think about where the function is being called. Think about where the function is being defined. And in that definition, consider where... And in that definition, consider what the undefined name means in that context. If it's not defined in that frame, look for it in the parent frame or the parent frame of the parent frame and keep going in that order. And as soon as you get to that name, anywhere else where that name is defined becomes immediately irrelevant. So the next point here is skeleton coding questions. These are infamous. These are the questions that most students in CS61A study hard for and struggle on. These problems will ask you to implement the code in a particular scenario, but they'll already give you a skeleton of the code. So they'll give you an exact skeleton for what the code should look like, but they'll basically take parts of that skeleton and they'll leave blanks in it. So you have to fill in the blanks and you have to complete the skeleton. And here are some essential tips. So the first tip that I have for you is implementation differences. So often you'll notice that the algorithm that you'll be asked to fill in the blanks to implement will be very different from the one that you first come up with. And this has some very important ramifications when we're talking about testing strategy. So obviously, we could just sit there and stare at the skeleton question and be like, oh, I don't know. I don't know how to solve this. I solve this in a different way. What do I do? But this is how you should approach it in terms of test taking strategy. In advance, you should make the following decision. Whether you intend to spend more time on your own pondering the question or whether you want to refer directly to the provided skeleton. So a potential advantage of pondering the question before actually looking at the skeleton is that you might be able to better grasp the structure of the problem without feeling confused or overwhelmed by the number of blank spaces in the problem. And this can boost your creativity and confidence when you're going to the test and you're doing those skeleton coding questions. But a potential disadvantage is that this can lock you into a, an approach that diverges from the one that's intended by the skeleton. So next, when referring to the skeleton directly, remember that all parts of the skeleton given to you will typically give away exactly what kinds of answers will fit into the blanks. So when you think about it, think about it like this. I have a skeleton. I have a blank right here. What kinds of possible answers in Python could fit into this blank in terms of data types? I want you to think in terms of data types. Could this blank be a list? Could this blank be a print statement? What kind of data type? do I fit into this blank? And that will make it much easier for you to figure out exactly what belongs there. The test writers make very intentional choices when they decide what to include in skeleton questions. 
they decide exactly where they're putting the blanks and they, and they do it in such a way that you'll always be able to answer the question. So you should definitely leverage the given structure of a skeleton coding question as best as you can. A good starting point, again, is to identify the data type. So now let's go into skipping around. So one thing that a lot of students will try to do and struggle with is that they'll read the code in a skeleton linearly. So they'll, so they'll start at the first line, they'll read that, they'll go through all the blanks, and they'll just go all the way down, and then they'll just feel overwhelmed and confused. Like, okay, that, that didn't make sense to me at all. I read it from the beginning to the end, but I still have no idea how to approach this. What can I do? So... This will seldom give you as much information or strategy as skipping around. Remember, when you're going into these skeleton questions, your main number one goal is to squeeze out as much information as you can from the little that's given to you in the skeleton code. But when you read linearly, you're forcing your brain to think about what, what fits into these blanks in a very particular and not necessarily meaningful or correct order. For example, even when Python's interpreting the code, it doesn't necessarily go in a linear fashion, right? If someone if something calls a function somewhere else, then Python will go and will skip to that function. It won't be reading linearly. So you should try to think like the interpreter when you're going into these questions. Skipping around when you read the skeleton can help your brain identify connections between pieces of code that I would not have otherwise identified. So it's always a good idea to think of, okay, what's at the beginning of the skeleton? What's at the end of the skeleton? And what belongs in the middle of the skeleton? Usually toward the beginning of the skeleton, it will be looking at the basic arguments that might be passed into a function and declaring some important variables or making some important statements that will be relevant for the rest of the question. And usually towards the end, it will be returning something or printing something that the question asks you to do. And then in the middle is where you read non-linearly to fill in all the gaps. So the next thing that I have to emphasize here also related to skeleton questions is doc tests. Refer to doc tests and spend time contemplating base cases, edge cases, and special cases. This is very, very important. And it may give you even more intuition when you actually try drawing them out by hand. This is very important because sometimes in the question, they won't even tell you what the base case should be, but the base case will just be something that's, that's included in the doc test and something that you're expected to have read. So make sure you read the doc test. Don't just skip over them. Don't just ignore them. The doc test are the doc test and they're very important. And of course, compare your work to similar problems that you've done before to find the path to a solution. If you notice that the structure of this problem is very similar to something that you've done in practice or something that you've seen in, in a discussion or a lab, then immediately your mind should jump back to that and try to draw the connections and try to fill in the gaps from there. The next tip here is iterative or recursive. Pay attention to whether the methods that are given in the problem are implemented iteratively or recursively. And so this will help you narrow down the options. For example, in a recursive problem, expect at least one blank in the recursive function to call that function again. If you aren't calling the function again, then you've done something wrong. You've misused one of the blanks, or maybe you have one blank left, and that's exactly where you have to make the recursive leap of faith. The next tip is that skeleton questions are often written in multiple parts that intend you to use revelations or even entire methods defined in your responses to previous parts. So remember, you aren't necessarily expected to reinvent the wheel in the problems. Oftentimes, you'll be dealing with information that you already discovered in a previous part of the problem. Finally, I'd like to conclude this handout by going over some recurring tricks. So if you go through all the past tests that CS61A has released throughout its history, then these past tests have very special recurring tricks. So make sure to practice these. And I'm going to discuss some key ones with you. But obviously, when you go back through the tests in your own time, you might notice some more tricks. Make sure you write them down on your cheat sheet or just remember how to do them. So the first tip here is the idea of an infinitely repeating list, right? For example, if we have a list like one, two, three, four, we can read through that list as one, two, three, four. But when we reach the end of that list, that's the end of the list. What can we do? How do we go back to the beginning? How do we cycle through the list over and over again? So this tip is that if we want to repeat a list, we can use the first element of the list, remove it and place it at the end. And this will effectively enable us to acquire a cyclic behavior that will be in, that will enable us to solve many otherwise tricky questions. And this has especially been common in questions involving yielding and iteration. So for example, one way to implement this in Python is a one colon plus the list of a of zero. So a one colon will splice the list from the element of index one all the way to the end. And then plus a of zero as a list will be taking that first element of a and adding it to the very end of a. And equivalently, I've also given this example to you in scheme. It's very simple. It's just define a and you're taking the CDR of a, which is everything else after the first element. And then you're just taking the list of the car of a, which is the first element and you're putting it at the very end. Next, we have the idea of copying a list. So to copy a list, there are two main ways that you should think of it. Uh, we can use a and then brackets with a colon in the middle, or we can say list of A. And the copy created will be completely independent of the original list A. This is an important theme in problems that require you to perform an algorithm that would otherwise require mutation or destruction. And we won't 
need to mutate or destroy the list. We can just make a copy of the list like this. In the past, this has often been tested in the context of tree problems. By the same token, pay special attention to whether the problem wants you to mutate something or make a copy. This is very, very important again. Again, we go back to doc tests here. If you want to identify the base cases or special cases in a coding style problem, always refer to the doc test. Don't skip them. Sometimes they're not explicitly stated. Always always, always go to the doc test. And the final tip that I have for you is related to problems involving the digits of numbers. So how can I just take a number that's maybe defined in a variable and get one of its digits? This is what you do. This is what you do. So one hacky way of doing this is converting the number into a string and then iterating through its characters. But harder problems, especially in midterms and finals, have almost never allowed you to do this. The intended solution often uses modular operations, which come from a branch of math known as modular arithmetic. But the key idea that you have to know here is that the last or the unit digit of a number can be computed as x mod 10. x percent 10, that percent sign is a mod. That means the remainder when I take x and I divide it by 10. And similarly, the last two digits can be computed as x mod 100, which is the remainder when x is divided by 100. The last three can be computed as x mod 1000 and so on. The pattern continues. And if we want to do something that combines multiple digits of x, to achieve something in a problem, then we can just use these basic modular expressions and we can recombine them with some basic math to get exactly what we want. All right, so that's all for that handout. But now I want to draw your special attention to two things on the CS61A website before I conclude this video. So the first thing is when you go into the 61A website and you go into the resources tab, then you can go into topical resources plus past exams. And this is a very, very important resource. You should definitely know by now this exists, but I'm again going to emphasize this for you. So here, what you can do is you can choose among many different workflows in terms of reviewing the concepts and doing practice problems. Again, practice problems are your number one best friend, and this is exactly what's going to take you through them. These are all the past exams that are available, and uh, there are also past mock exams here, and these are all the past midterm and final questions sorted by topic. So if you can identify through your practice that there are particular topics that you struggle on, then these will really enable you to hone in on the topic. So for example, if you struggle on mutability, then you can go here and you can practice all of these questions, and then you can go into the solutions. And make sure that when you go through these problems, if you don't understand something, make sure you go into the solutions. Please, please, please don't leave any gaps in your preparation. Make sure you go into the solutions and make sure you understand exactly how to do it. So if you made a mistake or if you, if you had a conceptual misunderstanding, the next time you see a similar question, you know exactly how to do it. And the next resource that I want to call your attention to is the CS61A Midterm 2 Study Guide, as you can see here. You can just Google this, and I'm sure course staff has also given you this link, but it's basically a two-page study guide that you'll have full access to even during the midterm. And the key thing here is that it covers all the syntax that you need to know for Python. But make sure before the midterm that you get well acquainted with the study guide, maybe if you're doing some practice, like some practice tests, then take it with the study guide in hand and make sure you know exactly how it's organized. So if you ever have a confusion or you need to look something up during the test, then you don't start panicking. You can just immediately flip to the study guide and just kind of skim through it and find where things are. Okay, everyone, so that's all for this video. Thank you so much if you made it this far and be sure to like, subscribe and comment and stay tuned for more content. And if you're taking midterm two for CS61A in about three days, then best of luck to you. And I'm sure that you're absolutely going to kill it. But yeah, see you all later.